and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Miles Adcox. Miles is a speaker and a coach and also one of the co-hosts of the Unspoken podcast. But most importantly, he is the owner and CEO of OnSite, which is an internationally known emotional wellness center, which delivers life-changing personal growth workshops, leadership retreats, and emotional treatment. So as you can guess in this conversation, we're going to talk about emotional wellness. And and this shouldn't be a surprising topic because honestly, one of the things that can lock you up and can self-sabotage not only acting on decisions, but the entire decision-making process is lack of emotional wellness. And before we get into the conversation, I do want to give you a highlight quote from Miles. In the conversation, he says that he doesn't think counseling is for people who are broken or struggling. He says, I think counseling is for anybody who wants to be a better version of themselves. And in fact, that's a lot of what this show is about. It's why we go beyond the to-do list. It's about productivity, but it's about so much more than just productivity. This show could easily have been called Productivity Plus or Productivity and dot, 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 something. I don't know, but I like my title better. Anyway, I hope you do too. But I was glad to have this conversation with Miles. It's a healthy conversation about not just thinking about emotional wellness in the sense that we only go to the doctor when we're truly, truly sick, but about having a proactive stance on that, which I know you'll find ties into many of the themes that we've talked about in this show with previous guests. So I'll get out of the way and say, enjoy this conversation with Miles Adcox. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Miles Adcox. Miles, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Eric. Thanks for having me. I have previously actually had uh, Donald Miller on the show twice, once uh, kind of talking about all the past stuff that he had done up till the point of, uh, you know, talking about story brand and things like that. But also on a separate occasion, he came and talked about his newer book, but this was a few years ago now, uh, Scary Close, which deals a lot with, uh, you know, being open and honest and just opening yourself up. And, you know, I'm not doing it justice, but you had a little bit to do with that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how how many people have sought out, uh, you know, my company on site uh, to get uh, support uh, based on uh, Scary Close. And, and Don's, he's just He's one of my closest friends, but he's a master storyteller, as you know. And it's so neat that he's pivoted and turned his uh, natural ability, his innate ability, I would say, into uh, how to teach people to tell a better story with their businesses. And I recently got to do a, a keynote for a lot of the guides that work underneath the story brand framework. And man, he's he's changing lives right and left with uh, the power of story. And no better guy to do it than Don Miller. He's just one of the best. So yeah, I'm lucky to call him a friend, but also grateful that he shared his story about his emotional healing journey at, at OnSite through Scary Close. I recommend the book all the time. So yeah. So I thought I, I figured I would, it, you know, that's one of those kind of maybe hidden gem uh, episodes that I've done again years ago. This was what, 2014, 15, somewhere back there, you know, years ago now. I'll link up to that in the show notes for people to dive deeper onto that. But uh, that brings up that you are the CEO of OnSite. And so for Donald, <laughs> I mean, I know Donald to a certain extent, probably not n- not nearly as well as you do, but have been to at least the old house and was there with the story brand group as he was just starting that up. For you to have done that work with him and, and for that book to have brought a lot more people's attention to OnSite, I'd love to get into what's OnSite's mission and you know how did you get involved with that? Sure. Yeah. Our mission is to ch- it's simply to change lives through enhanced emotional health. And we we do that because we believe there's just a deficit of it out there in, in culture specifically right now. And you can you could trim that down to uh, even just saying people feeling disconnected, overwhelmed and a little burned out. And now that can manifest in a lot of mental health issues. But if you just take it into it's something if we humanize it, it's something everybody struggles with, which is dealing with an overt amount of stress in today's climate. We just see so much of it. And there are good resources 
resources. However, there are not many resources that have tried to position themselves to move towards culture. A lot of people, including us, that have been in the mental health space, we kind of sit back and put together, hopefully, sophisticated clinical modalities that help people change their lives. And we're here when you need us. In other words, call if you're in trouble. And I started thinking a few years ago, we got that all wrong. We don't need to wait on people to come to us. We need to go to people. So we started shifting our messaging and trying to humanize the idea of struggle and take it to culture instead of waiting on culture to come to us. The way we the way we do that is is we have a, a retreat center west of Nashville, about 45 minutes, and we're on a couple hundred acres, a beautiful uh, property. And people come uh, from anywhere from four to six days uh, to do kind of a deep dive on their their narrative and rewrite parts of their stories that may not be working for them. You could call it kind of an emotional health retreat center, a personal growth retreat center. And we, we definitely use a sophisticated, uh, you know, mental health experience. And we have top notch therapists from around the world that come and facilitate. But at the end of the day, we really try to make it just it's something anybody could benefit from and not just when something's on fire in your life. So that's that's kind of a little bit about on site. And I guess I, th- I think you also ask how I got into it. And that's a, a longer story. The short the short version. Then you can tell me if you want to know more is uh, it, it wasn't by accident. It was through the lens of my own experience. I I was someone who in my early 20s, uh, everything looked wonderful on the surface and exterior. I had a good resume, a good career, and on paper, things were couldn't have been better. But yet internally, I had this longing for something different that I had ignored long enough and shut down my capacity for emotion that I, I wasn't even literate in that space. And I was just navigating life. Uh, assuming I could be disconnected for what was underneath the surface. And it caught up with me and it caught up with me and it looked like depression and anxiety and stress and burnout and some of the things I talked about earlier. And I didn't know what to do with that because I thought as a guy in our culture, the last thing you can do is ever speak out about it. But thank goodness I did. And when I did, the right people came around me at the right time. I got support, kind of the lights came on and I just fell in love with the change process. I shifted careers at that time and got into the helping profession. And that led me to today uh, leading a great organization like OnSite. It sounds like your journey was kind of an example of why there needed to be, you, you realized there needed to be a shift there. I couldn't help but think of when you were talking about, well, we're here. And when you have an emergency, go ahead and call us. And and that being the common uh, way people treat just regular, you know, bodily health care. It's like, uh, I don't, you know, unless I have like a sinus infection or like I've got this pain that's been ongoing, I'm not going to go see the doctor, right? Yeah, same. I think we, and, and we even neglect mental and emotional health more than we do on the physical side. And everybody, including me, is uh, capable of, of neglecting both. But yeah, we, we just do that too much in culture. And it's primarily because it's got such a stigma attached. And that's another been another part of our mission is not just to enhance emotional health in people and leaders. It's also to reduce stigma around the idea of, of perfection in, in this unsustainable model that we see through almost every lens of advertising that tells us we should be more than we actually are capable of being. And it's just a setup for failure. And so I love when we have the opportunity to undo that for people and give them a realistic vantage point on how to live a good life. I love that the words you're using, that that you're involving it with culture, that you're taking it to culture, that you're this move towards culture and commonality, or, or I should say just th- that in other words, there, there should be a new status quo that we should be able to talk about these things and deal with these things much sooner, much, much more early than them becoming actually symptoms of a bigger problem and they flare up, right? Yeah, you said you said it well. I, I don't think prevention should be a, a warning sign. I think it should be a conversation. And I think the way we um, alleviate a lot of the emotional pain, which manifests in all kinds of physical problems in the world today, is we simply bring it into the forefront and talk about it more. And that's what seems to be missing by the time people get to it. And it's not that we don't work with people when they're going through crisis or adversity. We, we do that as well. But usually when those kind of people get to us, it's just a, a deficit of an effective and empathetic place to offload stress. And therefore, and it's 
we think of it as, well, these people must really have problems in their history or they must really have difficult. And, and yeah, we, you know, I know one in three typically do. However, it's not what you would think. There's a lot of really high functioning people that have never had a healthy outlet to be vulnerable and communicate their truth, not just the, the pretty truth, but the hard edges that ends up catching up with us later on. So I think you're exactly right. We just need this needs to be a prevalent part of the conversation in everyday life. The way that technology and culture have moved forward, uh, intertwined in such a, I'll go ahead and say it, dangerous way that, we, that that it's so commonplace that, you know, our our moments are now filled with activity, you know, our quiet moments that we used to have to maybe even have our thoughts and think them versus just swat them away uh, and maybe even, uh, you know, become earlier aware of uh, not issues, but just even being in a moment and being ourselves, right? That in other words, the margin we had is now kind of gone. Yeah. And for some reason, and I think it was well-intended. I don't think any of us uh, at any era uh, had set out to do harm, but it, we just, we all are going to make mistakes. Every generation I think is going to make mistakes. And we hope that the one behind us pays attention and is awake enough to try to do something about it, to shift it and make it a bit better, take what's good and try to innovate where things need to be improved. And I think you're speaking into one of them. I think years ago we looked at things like daydreaming as a problem. Uh, and now we know it to be a vital element, especially for the creative process, but just for our emotional health is that we need margin to be able to turn our brains off and we don't create enough of it because it's not a cultural norm. And for you know for your your expertise around productivity uh being and i'm sure you've talked to guests that are highly productive that would probably echo some of this or maybe have in a smarter way than i am i'm coming through the mental health or emotional health lens but i think it's the same thing is that in order to be productive i believe we have to create margin and we have to have space in our lives to have some sense of balance because i know I'm a product of my own work and I can get on the hamster wheel just like any other leader who is very busy and I, I even even armed with the tools to know what to do. And sometimes information alone doesn't create sustained change. We have to really dig in and figure out what is anchored internally that keeps us stuck in an old narrative and an old message. And that's been a tough one for me. I tend to move towards workaholism more than I'm proud of. So I have to stay on top of that. I have to be honest with it. I have to have accountability around it because I know my best work happens when I've got margin and when I've got the ability to slow down and do a lot with a little bit of time. Yeah, that margin to create and even giving our brains, uh, you know, that downtime. The person that made me the most aware of it in recent years has been Michael Hyatt, uh, where he's been so intentional about taking uh, weekends and even the evenings off and not just saying I'm going to do something intentional, but actually planning out a weekend. And I thought to myself, oh, who plans out a weekend? But He's so intentional about, uh, and especially his naps, <laughs> daily, almost daily naps and <laughs> weekend naps and uh, just the recharging that, that that goes on there. And it's not about filling up every moment, but it's about having that, that downtime uh, and that that is an antidote to the constant push to be not successful because in, in the way that people uh, see it, which is being constantly busy, but successful in all matters of our lives, which is, you know, heart and and mind and body and, and soul even. Yeah, I think you said it well, and I, and I couldn't agree more. I, I, it sounds like I'm not as, as close to Michael as you are, but I, I know him and know his work. And it, it, yeah, he's a he's the king in, in this area in terms of productivity. He's, he's set such a standard with being intentional about how to carve out just what you said. I, I couldn't say it better. And it sounds like I could spend some more time with him. I didn't know about the nap piece. Um, oh, yeah. That sounds attractive. So with your work in on site with people, I mean, how have you seen some of this? Let's just call it lack of downtime or you know, Uber connectivity, uh, with technology. I mean, how have you worked with people, uh, with some of the symptoms that come from that? And, you know, do you have any like quick wins kind of things like, Hey, think about this. Or if you feel like you're struggling with this, here's something else you can try. 
Yeah. I, you know, to me, it's, it's more changing the perspective than the habit and the perspective over time, I think shifts the habit. So I don't think I'm out as a goal to try to shift people 180 degrees and stop something on a dime. I'd rather shift them two degrees that over time it spreads out almost if, 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 if people who spend time on the water and know about sailing, you know, two, if you get off two degrees on course on the water, you're going in a totally different direction once you're down the path a little bit. And I think we need to view change the same way. So I would look at it like busy is not really the problem. It's our relationship with busy. And I think we often, far too often wear it as a status symbol. And it's the very first thing we respond to about 90% of the question of how you doing? I'm really busy. And that's what that means something. But as you said, there's more to the story there than just being busy. And so we, as it, as it relates to technology, I think you put that in there too, about how do you handle the onslaught of information constantly being put in front of us through social avenues and, and TV and film and everywhere else. And I would say that I would caution over consumption until I, I wouldn't consume a lot of output until we learn to edit the input, if that makes sense. So when when we are taking on a whole lot of information and we've never done the work internally to understand what parts of it fit and what parts of it don't, then we'll end up taking on false narratives that will make us make decisions based on the algorithm of the formula of the people who are masterminding the information and meaning particularly the news cycle. Mm. There, there is a lot of strategy that go PR strategy that goes into behavior change. They want the end consumer to stay connected as long as they can. And therefore they put these, I hate to say manipulative, but in a way that's what we're trying to do is get into your subconscious. They're using our information uh, to try to increase ratings. So we just have to be a little as smart as they are. I don't think they're doing anything wrong. I say they, I've worked in the advertising community too, and I, I advertise my own product. So we're not doing anything wrong. We have to be wise about our internal input. What are we taking in and what is the message that it's telling us about us and how do we make sure it stays on course with who we're trying to become? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the news and I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, this this consuming of the constant flow of information, because that's that's actually something that I wasn't even thinking about in terms of the technology. But that def definitely fits right in with uh, the constant use that we were talking about. And of course, you know, with the news cycle and, and the way that I'm, I'll just go ahead and say it, like social media has played into, you know, the constant news cycle. I mean, it used to be the constant. There didn't used to be a constant news cycle. Then there was, and it was on TV, but then it took to the screens uh, that we used to, to do our work. And then it moved to the screens that were always with us in our pocket. So... <laughs> It's it's been an interesting flow, um, and you're making me think of. Are you familiar at all with Cal Newport and uh, his digital minimalism book that came out uh, early this year? No, but I'll I'll check it out. It that's, sounds interesting. Yeah, that's exactly kind of where you're going with that. And I mean, he he has this in, incredible book. Uh, again, it's Cal Newport Digital Minimalism, and he was on the show, and we talked about this, and it was you know, and he goes into it briefly. But I mean, the way that these the social media networks and even some of the operating systems are designed is to keep you on those systems longer. It's, it's eyeballs, it's attention. So, and of course, you know, Apple has done, I don't know if, and I'm not an Android person, so I don't know. So, you know, if anybody's listening and they're like, Android has this too, but like, I love that the, the screen time features came to Apple because that has helped me to be able to do, uh, you know, have have a more of a, a, a watchdog eye on how much time I'm spending on my screens, even when I'm not fully aware of it. And even my 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 wife and my two kids, I can kind of monitor without monitoring. And I'm glad that they're bringing more nuance to that coming in the uh, iOS updates coming later this year. So, yeah, I think the this the these these newer generations, um, millennials and, and even the newest are a bit more socially conscious than the, than mine and, and the ones to follow. And I think that even though they're, we're part of innovating and creating this technology there, I think they're going to be faster than we were at uh, doing proper research to find out ways that it's creating negative impact and then creating uh, solutions to counter that. And I guess I would compare it to like, 
nicotine smoking or tanning beds. I don't know the, the stuff of our generation that we just, you didn't know. And even when you did know, you started getting surgeon general's warning, but the surgeon general's warning didn't necessarily immediately slow down use. It wasn't until we had a mounting uh, body of evidence and data of how it's killing you that people finally started to slow down and to decrease. And now we see that with vaping, it's it's starting to get back up there again, and even with all this information. So again, information alone doesn't necessarily change it, but I agree. Some steps in the right direction, particularly on technology, are the screen time. But you know, too, I use it as well, and it's just as easy. It's two clicks to, to approve all day, particularly on Instagram. <laughs> so it doesn't, it's, you can within, I think, under five seconds, take that, that warning sign to say you're spending too much time and bypass it if you're really in stress, which I do too much. Uh, but I do think it's a good start, and I think more is going to be revealed at just how much the onslaught of information and technology is overwhelming us and what that's doing to our brains. When it comes to the constant stream of information, and I'm thinking, you know, not just technology, but the the news media or media in general. I mean, it could just be constant Netflix. Um, what are some of the ways that you've seen are helpful in terms of, uh, you know, gaining better awareness or again, you know, you, you talked about it earlier. It's 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 perspective shift. It's not about changing the habits, at least outright, but changing the perspective first. What are some ways that we can go about doing that? I don't think change really starts to happen until we can at least match uh, the pace of the problem. And so if technology in this case, and we know it's not all a problem, there's a lot of good that it's doing too, but we'll say we're the problematic parts. If we're consuming that 85% of the day and we're spending 5% of the day, or I'll say 95% of the day and we're spending 5% of the day talking about how it could be problematic to us, then you see how the, the scales are way off. I think we have to be talking about it 50% of the time, consuming it 50% of the time. The only way it gets into our subconscious and to change is if we spend more time on it. Now, good news is you pull up, put on the news cycle, and the Today Show has a segment pretty frequently about the danger of social media and that is causing anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, and particularly our youth. So we are seeing more of it, but I think we need more of it in our homes, in our relationships, in our workplaces. It needs to be a constant conversation, which is the only way I think it'll get important enough in our brains to actually change it. I think one of the other potential changes here is is to turn away. And I mean, we're painting we're painting a picture here of, oh, technology is bad. And, and it's definitely not all bad. And in some ways, it's actually depending upon the technology, per, perhaps um, it's neutral. But, it, you know, in technology can you, you mean you and I are connecting through technology right now. We're having a great conversation. And then in post, as people are listening to this, they're benefiting from listening to the conversation and they're also using technology to listen to it. So we have to keep that in mind as we're as we're going about, you know, talking about technology and all that. And and I know, you know, I've used technology my whole life thinking been enamored with it. And, you know, I used to play too many video games. I still probably do. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, I think one of the things that we can then switch to is this idea of analog, of having face to face or even using technology to have connection with humans, to have, in other words, healthy relationships, uh, accountability, community even, that having interaction with people and not just the information or the tasks at hand. That's a path towards better mental and emotional health. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's whatever supports us in making it a priority, which is one of the reasons why I've always been drawn to what we would call an intensive model when it comes to change. Because traditional, I, I don't think counseling is for people who are broken or struggling. I think counseling is for anybody who wants to be a better version of themselves. And so I, and you can call it counseling, call it coaching. Coaching is a little bit safer and more trendy way for the business sector to embrace it. And it doesn't matter to me as long as you're looking at yourself and what needs to change and improve constantly. We're constantly doing kind of a self-evaluation. Some, some systems have it built in, but most don't. But I think when, when we, when we do that, we have the opportunity we have the opportunity to constantly create new conversation. And it's hard to do in a 50 minute session, which is the traditional counseling session. That's why I like four days of detox you from technology, untethered time. And 
Because ultimately what it's doing, the negative side of it is that it numbs emotion. And emotion to us as human beings is like oxygen, but we don't treat it that way. And when we don't have it, uh, accessibility to it, or we numb certain emotions, they end up manifesting into something a little more dangerous and causing stress and physical symptoms. And that's the biggest obstacle I've seen with technology. And the reason I like a four day or a week long uh, workshop or something where people just jump into it is that we end up giving them what culture doesn't is you don't hear a lot of people talking about how they feel in everyday life. But when you come somewhere for a week and that's you literally spent 90 percent of your time every day doing that. then at the end of it, it's a priority. You realize the value and you want to do something about it. And I think that's where we've got to get around balancing technology as well. I love this idea of, you know, it, almost in a sense of having that retreat, that detox retreat where you're getting away and doing the hard work. I wonder then what are some of the ways that if somebody has done that or even if they can't do that right away, they can start to uh, interact in a community setting and have some of the benefits of that start to um, take place in their life. I'm a big proponent of that counseling, uh, personal growth, emotional health change should not be reserved for the counseling office. I think we have to. And so in other words, I'm basically saying, yes, I've got a good business and a good program that offers a service. I'm just one of a a lot. Uh, But I don't think people need to stop or start there. I think we need to build this into our communities. And sometimes community can be hard if you're in stress and struggle, because the last thing you want to do is reach out to someone else or try to find your way into community, particularly if personality wise, you're wired differently. You know, a lot of people that that uh, aren't prone uh, to social circumstances or they're a little bit lean towards introversion, then they might not be as likely to move into proactively move into community, particularly when they're stressed. That's why I think we just need to change the way community function and community can be one person and one person. And if you've got one safe person that you can take a risk and empathize and tell them a little bit of your story, that's the start of community. And it's a really good one. So don't wait because there's so many people that couldn't afford a service like ours or that don't have the time to go to counseling or, or, or whatever else I might be suggesting as a means to improve their life, you can do that in your own living room, in your own backyard. You can even do it on social media if you find the right people. Find people to speak your truth to. It's vitally important. Some people are out there, they're, they're hearing us talk about this and they're thinking, yeah, I don't know if I have anybody in my life that fits that description of I can speak my truth to them. What kind of attributes would you say to somebody that, uh, you know, they're, they're seeking out this this kind of micro community, if you will, let's call it that, uh, to be able to, you know, have coffee with somebody, but they don't know who to turn to or who might already be in their life. Like what kind of uh, what kind of attributes or what kind of tips can you give them in terms of who to look around and see, like, here are the questions you need to ask yourself about who might already be in your life that could help you with that? Well, first, I would validate them in saying that if you have that thought of I don't have anybody to speak my truth to that I trust, you're probably right. Uh, And and I don't mean that um, to to discourage you. I mean that to validate you because your instincts are good, that most people are not wired to be able to empathize and hold your struggle without trying to advise you on how to fix it, which is the exact opposite of what you want when you tell somebody your truth. Most people, it's just counterintuitive until you have the opportunity to do the work yourself. And then you suddenly now some people are naturally wired to it. But when you have the opportunity to do your work yourself, then that changes something internally. Your, your ability to empathize goes up. Your need to fix goes down and suddenly you become a safe outlet for somebody. So I would first say you're probably right. There may not be many people around you that aren't going to try to advise or pull you out of something. That may not be what you want right away. But there are people out there. I would say that. And the the way to start this process is with you. Community, I believe, is an inside starts as an inside job and then moves into an external validation. So what I mean internally is if I'm looking for a friend that I don't have now, then I need to learn to be that friend before I track that friend. And so I need to write that. You can journal that. You can write it down. You can figure out what are the things that I'm looking for? What is it I'm scared to say? The more comfortable you get with your own voice, the more likely you'll give grace to the people who aren't going to receive it perfectly. That's great. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. I have some friends. Um, For a while there, there was a season where I didn't have 
uh, or it seemed to me that all my friends were moving away. Uh, and that was something that was hard to, to deal with. And, and that actually, ironically for me, was also that season where technology was ramping up in my life uh, because it was being adopted as a, you know, in culture itself, but also because I was seeking out something, anything. That would kind of, you know, as you were talking about earlier, maybe numbing the emotions or quieting them uh, because I had stuff to do. There was ex- there was expectations, external uh, expectations on me to uh, be a certain way or do certain things, uh, uh, you know, during the day job, uh, you know, and uh, it didn't matter. You had to just get through it and get done. But uh, I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, I don't want anybody here to. um sit here and struggle, you know, in their cubicle or at home or feel like they're by themselves. I know it's, it's kind of hard to, it, it's definitely for it, for me kind of hard to hear you say, uh, yeah, there may, maybe, and probably there isn't anybody to talk to, but you can start by talking to yourself. <laughs> yeah. And I want to, and I don't, hopefully that's not this, the, the, the part of that narrative or that talk that they'll pull to, and that's why I was careful with how I framed it. But I just wanted to validate that it can feel that way. It absolutely can feel that way. And I, I think we're too quick to prescribe you're not alone when if somebody feels alone, we first need to start with, I understand what it's like to feel alone. And I, and, and not everybody can understand, relate to that. I can. It seems like um, I, you didn't say those words, but you just you were kind enough to relate to a time in your life that was a little more challenging. And I think that's what we need more of. You just became a little safer for me to lean into. And I think others, when we are vulnerable with our truth, then we invite other people into that space. And likely the people next to us are looking for that as much as we are. They may not know it yet, but people are out there. But your first instinct of saying, I'm not sure they are, that's okay. It's okay to believe that and trust it and then to do something about it. I think it's far too long. We've tried to prove people wrong. And when you're in flux, when you're in a, when you're in kind of this pre-contemplative state about what should I do or what shouldn't I do, and we begin to get advice that tells us we're either right or wrong, then we, we're not likely to be invited into change. What we need is to be able to be held in ambiguity so that we're more likely to be, take the next step. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, uh, this this idea of again going back to earlier what we were talking about is i think then somebody who feels like they're alone will try to avoid that that resting that downtime that that uh that idle time where those voices inside themselves that remind them them that they are alone or at least remind them of that feeling that they are alone because they they in actuality may not be but uh that that Time is something they'll actually avoid that that healing time is something that they would avoid, in other words, yeah, I think we've just got to we've got to hear people's perception, even if it's not real and and i and I'll challenge the perception it's okay to do that as long as we can they can trust that we can understand and hear it i mean the the reality is that we're not alone and 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 it's okay to hear that, but not to the cost of challenging your perception and how real it is for you. First, I need to understand how real that is before I can invite you into the idea that it's not true. So it's not, it's not about proving people wrong. It's about, I guess I'd say it's Bob Goff, I think is where this quote um, belongs and another dear friend of mine, but he says, we don't hold people accountable, hold them close. And I think that's a crucial part in the beginning of this process is we kind of want to put our, unintentionally put a finger out and be the accountability police to try to tell people what they should and shouldn't be doing when they're in, in pain. And the truth is, is they're probably looking for more of an embrace than advice. I really hope that as people are overhearing us talk about this, that this is somewhat a new normalizing, that the status quo could be changed, that that, that there's not some, you know, pre- uh, determined, okay, well, I guess I can never talk about these things or, uh, normal or even saying normal people don't talk about these things. Right. I agree. It's, it's becoming, thankfully it's trending mental health in general. And it's not just in, in our space. It's not just in, uh, the faith space or the business sector or the political sector. It's trending everywhere, which is good news. But we still have a long way to go. I think we're years away from getting reconnected and grounded as a community and as a culture. But there are pockets and we're on the way, which is exciting. 
but it's it's becoming not so cool to stay stuck, struggling, depressed, medicated as it might have been 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. It's becoming way more hip and cool now to, to p- pursue your own emotional health and to talk about it, which is, I think, a really good thing. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I'm glad to be able to talk to you about this, but I think that one more thing we could do is maybe point people to anywhere that they could continue uh, either the conversation or digging into maybe some resources. Uh, would you mind maybe sharing uh, a little bit about where somebody could turn to for that? If you have resources, either financial or, in, or, or insurance, and I would suggest if you've never done professional counseling, I'm a big advocate of it. And I, I'm not advising it. I'm, I, I don't think you need it. I just think you deserve it. I think it's been branded all wrong for so long. Uh, I think it's always been positioned as this is where you go when you're really screwed up. And it's not what's wrong with you that you would seek out counseling. It's what's right with you. So just know that. And counselors, I can't give you all the names of the ones in your community and backyard, but just know they're in the smallest towns or a little harder to find if you're in a tiny community. But hopefully you're within a drive of being able to find some good therapeutic resources. I'll also say that that profession is human and that uh, not all counseling is the same. No different than not all churches are the same, not all businesses. Just be careful that you don't take one risk and you get mismatched or you get frustrated and you just decide it's not for me. Sometimes it can take several times to find the right professional support, but I think everybody, again, deserves that. So I think that's one option is reach out. If you've never done a counseling session, it's something I'd invite anybody to do, regardless if you think you need it or if you're just wanting to grow as a leader or be more productive in your in your case. Um I think uh, coaching is another good way to go. Uh, if there is more going on, if you've got more adversity going on in your life and you, you really feel sidelined or struggling to get out of bed or dealing with some difficult things, and we know probably some of the listeners are, then there are residential resources that uh, deal with bigger issues. And I'll say the same thing about them. I'll frame them up and it's, I don't look at somebody going to rehab as a punishment that life has gotten so bad that they've got to go somewhere to do time. I look at it like this is just human school. And for whatever reason, you've been invited into going to become a better version of yourself and be more humane to yourself and other people. And that's the biggest gift you'll ever get. I never, I never saw it that way when I went in my early twenties, I thought life is ending as I know it, that I have to go somewhere and try to deal with my issues. And when I came out the other side of it, I thought, how in the world do we not have a a culture that the whole world doesn't get an opportunity to go somewhere for 30 days to be a better human being. So look at your, if you've got, if you've got big challenges right now, I hope you'll, you'll start to see them as this will eventually be a gift. It won't feel like it right now, but it will be. And there are resources out there that can support, support you in whatever area of your life that you're trying to deal with. That's awesome. Also, I would love for you to maybe outline uh, what are some of the options that uh, people could seek out in terms of what you guys do at OnSite? Yeah, so we uh, we have a variety of short term intensive workshops that you can either do individually uh, as a couple or as a family. Most of our programs are individual, so I, I'm not sure the number is probably somewhere between eight and ten different offerings that we will uh, interchange throughout the year. But pretty much every week, 50 weeks out of the year, we've got workshops beginning and ending, and and people coming in from all over the world. So you can you can uh, check out our website to see what offerings we have. The one I'll point out, and there's multiple, is the Living Centered program, which is kind of our flagship. Uh, a week long workshop. It's something that we're kind of known for that a lot of people, it's the one Don talked about in Scary Close. It's what a lot of people use us for. And it's, it's really good. It's kind of a catch all for anything in your life that might be going on that you want to improve on. If you're going through change, transition, really difficult times, or you just want to raise your EQ. It's kind of a fit for everybody because it's kind of a catch all of all of our work. And then we've got more specific programs like healing trauma and different things. We've also I've also got a longer term residential offering offering that's kind of emotional health treatment for people that have more acute uh, issues or struggles, and they, you know that that one's more like thirty days plus. But those are those are some of ours. And again, I know ours are not uh, obtainable for everyone, and just know that I think sometimes people hear the right invitation. And they think that's for me, but yet there's this limitation. And 
I'm, I'm happy to serve you any way we can if we're the right fit, but we're not the only fit. You need to hear that, that there are good resources everywhere. And we're happy to help you find them, by the way. If our program's not a fit, we've got a team of experts that you could call us. If you live in somewhere way far away and don't know what's in your area, call us and we, we can help you navigate that and create a roadmap for you. That's very generous, and I, I'm really glad to hear that. Miles, it's been awesome talking with you today. I really hope that, again, people listening in on this conversation were brought to a greater sense of awareness of the acceptability. Uh, like you were saying, it's becoming more acceptable to talk about this, but we've got a long way to go. I hope that we move the needle a little bit today. So great talking with you. Thank you. And I appreciate you having, I know it's a little bit probably out of the, no, well, I don't know that, but I'll make up that it's a little out of the norm for a podcast talking about productivity and leadership business, the things that you guys expert are experts on to bring this into it. But I really affirm that you do, because I think it's vital to all those processes. I've become 10 times more productive, the more my EQ has gone up and I've reconciled parts of my story that just don't make sense anymore. And so I think it's relevant, but it's a bit of a risk because we just don't do it enough. So I would say thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, that's another episode crossed off your podcast listening to-do list. I hope you enjoyed this conversation that I had with Miles Adcox. Thanks again, Miles, for speaking with me about this very important subject. I hope that you were able to get something out of this conversation and didn't just hear, oh, you know, you should go to counseling because that was totally not the point. It really was more about the fact that counseling has its benefits it's great. I've done it. I actually am intending to do it again very soon, but it's not because of having specific issues, though that is a very good reason to do so. It's all about being proactive. It's about being aware, which again, that is one of the things that we have talked about continually in past episodes of this show is self-awareness is going to lead you to greater understanding of yourself and then enable you to continue to become your best person and be truly productive. So with that said, if you know of somebody who after listening to this conversation, you know, would be interested in learning more or thinking about this topic and what we talked about in this conversation. I'd love for you to share this with them. I'm not saying blast it on social media or share it out publicly, but I am saying if you know of some person, that one person would be great for you to share this with. So think of that person and share it with them. And I've got a bunch of great episodes coming up. So if you're not subscribed, subscribe. And with that, I will say, see you next episode. <laughs>